Hello, very good morning to you, Honorable Minister Ed Vesey. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. It's uh, pretty early for you, uh, early morning call for you. Well, I've already been to the gym, so, you know, middle-aged men get up very early. Very good, very nice. Uh, we had a nice conversation a few days ago, and i um, very happy to see you again today. We understand that, you know, the United Kingdom got on board this creative industries agenda much earlier than a lot of other countries. Could you maybe share with us, uh, you know, the journey of the, the UK narrative of the creative industries, uh, what you feel is very, very special? So first of all, thank you for having me. It's wonderful to have watched some of your conference and to see people physically in a room together, properly socially distanced, but it's great to see the creative economy being celebrated in Malaysia. I think uh, it's fair to say that the UK has been on this journey for 25 years. In 1997, when Tony Blair, who belongs to a different party to me, uh, the Labour Party, uh, became Prime Minister, he appointed a man called Chris Smith as his Secretary of State uh, for the creative industries, if you like. And Chris Smith, I, I think, should take some credit for uh, inventing the term, if you like, the creative industries, as far as government is concerned. And what he did was he took uh, different industries, which perhaps operated in silos as far as government was concerned, and put them together in a whole. So film, television, video games, but also architecture, design, fashion, 13 in total. And by doing that, first of all, it was the first time the government could actually see the economic contribution that all these different industries uh, make to the UK economy. And secondly, it allowed them to take a sort of holistic view of the kind of policies that would support them in the UK, be that uh, a focus on skills, intellectual property protection, uh, content creation, and so on and so forth. So that was the start of the creative industries journey. And uh, in the last 25 years, I think it's fair to say that because of that decision, the creative industries have taken a much more prominent role in policy making in the UK than they might otherwise have done. And that's included, and I'm sure we'll talk about it during our chat, uh, issues like tax credits, tax incentives, a focus on skills, as I've mentioned before, uh, and a recognition of the contribution that they make to the economy. So I understand that the United Nations has begun um, advocating a slightly different framework, which is the creative economy framework, whereas the United Kingdoms have been largely still use the creative industries. What do you understand from this different framings and are there values in looking at it from the perspective that the United Nations is advocating? I think to a certain extent, the terms creative industries and creative economy are interchangeable, but I think that the creative economy brings an additional uh, thought pattern, if you like, to policymakers, which is to understand that every industry to be successful needs an element of uh, creativity. You know, I, uh, I am a sucker for design and I have my iPhone here. And uh, we know that uh, a lot of people buy an iPhone, not necessarily because they think its functionality is better than its competitors, but because they love Apple design. They're very much invested in the brand. I think it's also important to recognize that many countries which have industrialized, China being an obvious example, where uh, effective and cheap manufacturing is now a given, uh, what uh, countries like that recognize as a gap, as it were, is creativity. Uh, the kind of skill set and mindset that sets you apart from your competitors, that adds that extra creative edge. And as I say, I think you see it really in a lot of successful products, uh, the creativity uh, that sets them apart from the mundane and helps uh, helps power your economy. Right now, we're going through COVID, and I think governments are really hard-pressed to you know, distribute what funds they have to all the different sectors, and therefore, we have limited budgets. So, so how did you, in, 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 in those times, deal with that and still drive the growth within the creative industries? Well, I won't pretend it wasn't very difficult. We had to go through our budgets line by line and we had to cut certain programs, which uh, personally I had a lot of support for, but uh, which were on the margins. And you had to find savings where you could. Uh, 
One decision I particularly regret is uh, cutting the budget of an organization called the Design Council in the UK, which promoted industrial design, uh, reminded businesses of the importance of design. And I think that was a cut too far. And also we had a very small budget in any event. So cuts to us were disproportionate. But having said that, one of the strengths of the UK creative economy, if you like, is that, for example, our, a lot of our museums, unlike say French and German museums, only receive, uh, only rely in part on government funding. They are quite entrepreneurial organizations. They generate money through philanthropy, through wealthy benefactors donating to them, and also through sales, through sales in their shops or charging for specific exhibitions. So for most of these organizations, government funding only made up about a third of their income. So even when we cut it, the rest of their income uh, was still secure and really up to them to generate. So uh, there were some regrets uh, in terms of uh, cutting funding, but the other, some of the really big impact uh, programs like the tax credits for the film industry, we did manage to uh, sustain. And we also, frankly, there is an element, although it sounds pretty brutal to say it, when you're faced with budget cuts, it's also an opportunity to do a bit of housekeeping. When money is very generous, different quangos spring up, different programs spring up, and nobody bothers to check whether they're working or effective. It's only when the money's running out that you have to go back rather like your household budget and say, well, actually, do I need to be paying for my subscription to this magazine or whatever? It's the same for government. Do I really need to fund this quango? Could I put these two quangos together and save money? So it was tough, but uh, I think we managed it quite well by being very careful with where we kept our funding. I think that the consumer is now far more aware of where products come from. And I think they're aware of climate change. And even if you don't, uh, even if you're skeptical about climate change, you know the damage that is being, to our, being done to our natural environment by industrial processes. You can see this already, I think, happening in the fashion industry. And it's partly been driven by the pandemic as well, that people are uh, thinking, why is the shirt that I'm buying so cheap? Uh, because it's dependent on very cheap labor. Uh, the material is uh, not sustainable. Uh, we've just had in September secondhand clothes week in the, in the UK, which is about people celebrating the fact that they've bought clothes from secondhand shops. Uh, and I think we see it in food and so on. And again, I think it becomes a differentiator for many uh, businesses and products to say how their products are sourced and manufactured. Uh, and I think when it comes to a choice for a consumer, price is obviously the, still the major factor. I, I'm not going to deny that for a minute. Uh, but I think when it comes from a straight choice and price is not a factor, then those things come into play. So I think creativity in thinking through how you communicate to the consumer your compliance with ESG and uh, creativity in creating uh, sustainable designs and products is something that's going to become even more important with every passing month and year. The tax incentives are the single most effective policy we've introduced for the creative industries, bar none. And uh, it doesn't surprise me to hear you say that maybe they haven't been as effective in Malaysia or whatever, because they're quite controversial. When I first came into office, our treasury, our finance department wanted to abolish them. Finance departments hate tax incentives. They think they distort the marketplace, they're an unfair subsidy and so on and so forth. But what they fail to recognize two things. Uh, one is that this is a competitive marketplace. If other countries are offering tax incentives, you've got to consider them because the industry is global and it can go anywhere. It can make a film in Outer Mongolia if the tax incentive is generous enough make it in New Zealand, it doesn't have to make it necessarily in London, where they're already competing with high prices for hotels and locations. So you're in a competitive marketplace, you need to compete. Secondly, these are highly capital intensive industries with high levels of risk. If you put $200 million into a film, you still don't know whether that's going to succeed. Uh, and therefore, you need to, uh, you need an incentive. So that's why we backed Originally, I stopped the Treasury abolishing our tax incentive. I can see I'm 
because of the way the sun is shining, I'm slowly disappearing. <laughs> I, I might put the blind down a bit. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> fine. I noticed that. <laughs> so that's incentive. Num- that's reason uh, number one. Uh, and secondly, as I say, capital, uh, the huge risks these industries take. Uh, so we started by saving the film tax credit. And the second thing we did was we extended it. Originally, the finance department gave me a flat refusal to extend it to video games, but Canada had introduced really generous tax incentives for video games. And we were literally seeing people getting on the plane and moving their companies to Canada. And we introduced the incentives for video games and visual effects and animation. And it's had an incredible impact. I think the creative industry has an important role to be kind of like the voice that expresses the soul of the nation or the people. Because during the COVID, I think there's a lot of musicians expressing, you know, hope uh, on, and or giving consolation to their neighbors or even online, actually. So I think there's a very important social aspect that we tend to forget that creative industries play, actually. And I think for that reason, it should be maybe uh, perpetuated. What do you think? Well, I'm delighted to hear you uh, spoke about that. And I think you're completely right. I think... Uh, you asked me earlier what the failures were of government. I think the other big failure, and it goes to my point about the creative industries not being taken seriously, is the massive impact the arts can make. Uh, they have a huge impact on health, mental health, loneliness, but also weirdly things like breathing. You know, somebody who suffers from a lung complaint can learn to breathe better using the techniques that a, an actor might use. Um, Criminal justice, you know, if you're going to put people, lock people up in prison and punish them, fair enough. But actually, uh, you can use the arts to take people who often commit crimes because uh, partly because of their background and allow them to express themselves and learn to socially interact through the arts. You can obviously, we've talked about schools, you can take kids Uh, not just the cleverest kids who are going to be fantastic at the arts, but kids who find it difficult to navigate the academic curriculum. You can give them confidence and self-esteem by allowing them to perform. You often find the kid who says nothing in class, you put them in a choir and they sing. Six months later, they're contributing fully to class. So I'm really pleased to hear you highlighted that. And I think that is something that uh, we really do forget. So once again, I thank you and... uh... I look forward to talking to you again very soon. I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for having me. Really stimulating conversation. And I've enjoyed the chat on the side as well. I've tried to keep an eye. (laughs) (laughs) Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Have a nice day. Thank you. See you.